So uh, today we're going to uh, continue our series looking at uh, the life of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke. Before we do that, let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, as we spend some time now listening to your word, we pray that the spirit of the living Christ would fall afresh on us and that your words of grace would melt us and mold us and fill us and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the Christ, entered into human history. And through his words, his life, his actions, his teachings, and his claims, he essentially drew a line in the sand. And it's a line that all of us, at some times in our lives, are going to have to come to terms with. With who Jesus is, and what it means for our lives and for our world. The great author... British author H.G. Wells of the uh, War of the Worlds said this about Jesus. I'm an historian. I'm not a believer. But I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. As we saw last weekend, atheists turned Christian, C.S. Lewis, put it in far more compelling terms. We read this last week. I want to read it for you again. C.S. Lewis says this, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him the Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. As I said last week, no matter where you are with Jesus at this point in your life, whether you're sitting on the fence or you're interested or you're casually engaged with Jesus or you're actively following him, at some point, like C.S. Lewis, we're all going to hear this unique claim of Jesus and we're going to have to come to terms with it. And what it means for us, for our world, and even for Jesus himself that Jesus is the Son of God. So 2,000 years ago, there was a non-Jewish doctor, a Gentile doctor by the name of Luke, who'd become a follower of Jesus. And he wrote a gospel of Jesus. He wrote a story of Jesus. And the main thing that he's looking at in his gospel is this. What does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? And all throughout his gospel, story after story, he's trying to expand for us what it means that Jesus is the Son of God. And not just the Son of God, but the Son of God for us. What does it mean for us that Jesus is the Son of God. So last week we spent just a few minutes reviewing the Christmas story, the story we spent all December looking at. Because the Christmas story essentially lays the foundation for what it means that Jesus is the Son of God for you and for me. And what it means is this, that you have a Savior. That forgiveness is now a reality for you in your life. That hope and joy and peace are now possible for you. That Jesus is the Son of God means that you have a Savior. Now in our stories for today, Luke helps expand on that theme. What it means that Jesus is the Savior. What it means that Jesus is the Son of God for you. And these two stories are the stories that launch Jesus into his mission of ministry. So Luke tells us that Jesus began his ministry when he's about 30 years old. And it started when Jesus made his way to the Jordan River where his cousin, John the Baptist, was baptizing people with a baptism of repentance and forgiveness. And so Jesus got in line. He walked into the water. His cousin baptized him by uh, lowering him into the water and drawing him back out again. And when Jesus came up out of the water, a dove descended on him, and God spoke to him. And God said, You are my beloved Son, And I'm fully pleased with you. I take great joy in you. Now to appreciate 
what it means in this story that Jesus is the Son of God, we have to put ourselves back into that story for a moment. John the Baptist was a hellfire and brimstone prophet. And his message to the people at that time was to turn from their sin, to turn from their lives of sin, to go in the direction of God, and to do so through a baptism of repentance and forgiveness. So here comes Jesus. Scripture says the sinless one. He's never committed any sin, and he gets in line for this baptism of repentance and forgiveness. Now, when Matthew tells this story in his gospel, he says that John is almost offended by this. And John says to Jesus, wait a minute, you should be baptizing me, not the other way around. But Jesus went to the Jordan River that day and went through the baptism that day because he wants to say something about this kind of Son of God that he is for you. And what the baptism of Jesus says about Jesus for you is this, that Jesus is the Son of God who aligns himself with sinful human beings. That Jesus is a Savior, that Jesus is a Son of God who enters into solidarity with God's lost children. Jesus is the Savior who stands with us. Or to put it in more dramatic terms, contrary to the belief that we often have that God is angry at us, in that moment when Jesus stood in line for that baptism, God stood in line with us, with sinful human beings. You see, just as in the birth story, God through Jesus enters into the whole of human experience as we live it from birth to death, so in that moment of baptism, Jesus aligned himself with us. He stood on our side. He entered into solidarity with us because Jesus is the Son of God who comes not to condemn but to stand with those of us who are lost and sinners. Now, right after his baptism, Jesus went out into the wilderness for 40 days, for a period of time. And it's near the end of those 40 days, when he's tired and hungry and lonely, that Satan comes. And Satan puts Jesus into the firestorm of temptation, a time of testing, asking him the question, are you really the Son of God? And again, in that experience, Jesus shows us the kind of Son of God he is. And what Jesus shows us here is he's the kind of Son of God who enters into temptation with us. When Jesus went through that temptation in the wilderness experience, he metaphorically was going back to the Garden of Eden and going through the temptation that Adam and Eve went through, that we went through. In the temptation in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve's humanity is called into question. Are you really human? You can be more than that. And so when Jesus is in the wilderness, he is being tempted. Are you really the Son of God? You can be more than that. And so Jesus is the Son of God who enters into the very human experience of temptation the way that we go through it. He goes through testing. He goes through those experiences of of feeling lust and wanting to make the wrong decisions because that's what we've experienced. He's a Savior who aligns himself with us and lives through the experiences of life that we live through. All throughout Luke's Gospel, again and again, we see Jesus entering into solidarity with human beings, entering into solidarity with us. He is a Savior who entered into the human experience, into your human experience through his birth. He is the Son of God who stands with you and stands in line with you, even though you are a sin-filled, lost human being, because he's on your side. And he's the Son of God who walks with you each and every day through the battles and the temptations and the testing that you experience. He has been there so that you don't have to go through it alone. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, 
He is able to help us when we are being tested. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say that we don't have a Savior who doesn't get us, who's unacquainted with our lives. We have a Savior who completely and perfectly understands it because he entered into every moment of human experience. He aligned himself with us and entered into solidarity with us. Jesus, the Son of God, is a Son of God, a Savior who is on your side. He has lived life from your perspective. He aligns himself with you even though you and I are sin-filled, loss-filled people because he loves us. He enters into temptation with us so that we don't have to go through it alone. And he comes to us today with the words that he heard spoken that got him through his entire mission and ministry and they're words that can change our lives forever. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. And I take great joy in you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's so easy for us to buy into the lie of Satan that you are angry with us, that you want to punish us, you want to harm us in some way. And so we thank you that you entered in the world in the person of Jesus to let us know the kind of God that you are a God who enters into solidarity with your creation, who goes through the human experience from life to death, who stands by us and stands in line with us even though we are sinners, and then who goes through the temptations we experience and goes through them with us each and every day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that through Jesus you get us and you love us and you claim us. And may those words of Jesus that we are your sons, your daughters, you take great joy in us. May they capture our imaginations and transform the way that we live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.